Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Kiara Alegria Judes to discuss My Broken Language, a memoir published by our friends at One World. Kiara Alegria Judes is a playwright, wife, and mother of two barrio feminist and native of West Philly, USA, hailed for her work's exuberance, intellectual rigor, and rich imagination. Her plays and musicals have been performed around the world. Judes is a playwright in residence at Signature Theater in New York and Profile Theater in Portland, Oregon, has dedicated its 2017 season to producing her work. She recently founded a crowdsourced testimonial project, Emancipated Stories, that seeks to put a personal face on mass incarceration by having inmates share one page of their life story with the world. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Jose Antonio Vargas, or Filipino Jose, as he prefers to be called. Filipino Jose is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Emmy-nominated filmmaker and Tony-nominated producer. A leading voice for the human rights of immigrants, he founded the nonprofit media advocacy organization Define American, named one of the world's most innovative companies by Fast Company. In 2020, Fortune named him one of its 40 under 40 most influential people in government and politics. His best-selling memoir, Dear America, Notes of an Undocumented Citizen, was published by HarperCollins in 2018. His second book, White is Not a Country, will be published by Pantheon in 2023. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of My Broken Language, or any other book you might need from Books and Books below, by pressing the green button. We truly appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Hello everyone, good evening. It's still afternoon here in the Republic of Berkeley where I'm at. <laughs> so we got two time zones going on here. Um, I was just saying, we, we just, I I know you from your work. I saw actually miss you like hell when it was at the public and couldn't really talk about it after I saw it because it was too much <laughs> in, in the best possible way. But when we just met a few minutes ago, I said that I feel like we have already met spiritually. Um, because I'm so thankful for everything that you've done and how you've done your work. And for me, if you don't already have it, order it, order it at your local bookstore. We have to support local bookstores as much as possible. So please order it. And I have lots of questions to ask, but I'm, I'm just going to get started. Right. And as someone who has written a memoir as well, and for me, it was really tough. Can you tell me about what was the most difficult process of writing this book? right? Kind of the most difficult things that you went through as you were processing how to how to really write about your life in this way. I think the biggest challenge was I knew I was always very clear on my intention. I wanted to write about uh, the women in my family uh, in the 80s and 90s in Philly when I grew up um, because it was a very painful time. You know, I was uh, speaking with a family member today who kind of casually said, you know, that was the time when the world tried to destroy us. And hmm. I said, and they succeeded partially, partially. And that partially is important because what I wanted to write about were the elements uh, that were <laughs> taking us down, uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, crack cocaine, the war on drugs, these things that became predecessors to later um, epidemics like mass incarceration. Um, so that was the setting. And those things affected our family in very painful ways and in ways that for me as a child were quite confusing. I didn't understand. And it was affecting the young people in my family. You know, uh, I didn't understand why so many funerals, why so much. Hmm. Loss. 
And what, if you looked at the news at the time, according to the news, it's because uh, it's bad people doing bad things, but not on the inside, not at Abuela's living room. They're mm. beautiful people living life and surviving. So I wanted to look at that, but I wanted to look at the survival too, because the thing is the joy of those times, the celebration yeah. of those times was magnificent. It almost, we partied harder and loved harder than, than we do today. And part of that came out of the survival. That joy was hard earned, that love was hard earned. So I knew I wanted to look at those things. That was always clear. The part that was hard was making sense of my life in a cohesive way because I'm mixed race, mixed ethnicity, uh, multi-language, multi-faith house. I live in West Philly, Abuela's in North Philly. Once my parents separate, dad's out on the main line in the suburbs. I like hmm. I like poetry. My, my dad's an atheist. Mom's a priest in of uh, in Yukumi of Chang'o. So how on earth to write a through line about that? I didn't know what my life amounted to or made sense. And then I found it in in the in the language. The language was what connected all of those disparate threads. Well, you know, as I mean, as you share in the memoir, you begun writing at such a young age and having mm -hmm. had such a really, uh, you know, when I when I look at your career, it's it's it especially with with your screenplay for In the Heights, which very excited about, like, it's kind of unparalleled what you've been able to do. And as I was reading the book, I was curious, how would you where would you place this book, My Broken Language, amongst your other literary works? Like, did it just flow instantly or was it a struggle putting it together? And how is writing a book, for example, different than writing a play or a libretto to a musical or a screenplay? Well, I've been professionally writing since 2004. And it, for 15 years, it was for the stage. Um, yeah. So I, I kind of lived a full professional life as a playwright, but it became this strange speci specialization Hmm. But that's never what writing had been to me. I just grew up writing, not being a playwright, just anything. Give me a pen, give me a paper, give me an hour to daydream, and here I go. Uh, give, me, give me my ears and give me a room full of grown-ups and let me hang in a corner and be quiet and just listen to how they tell stories, you know? So the thing that feels the most different for the playwriting versus writing this book um, it was similar in that I was trying to find my voice. When I'm writing plays, I'm trying to find other characters' voices and yeah. the music, the music with which they speak. And um, I was just doing that for myself. So that felt familiar. Um, the different part was knowing that people were going to be encountering the book in, in privacy. It's really different than knowing. Really intimate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, so on stage, one of the things you brought up, Miss You Like Hell, which is my um, musical about a mixed documentation family. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's really intense because you watch the audience, you watch them absorb the play. It's a very public sphere for sharing stories. Um, so if the audience has been in a bad mood because it was a really cold and rainy day, that affects the vibe, you know? This is much more personal. And so I tried to write from a different space, not of we're all in a room together, but let me speak to you directly, reader. Let me speak heart to heart. Did you find yourself though, at some point feeling like, okay, so th this is a, di I'm writing in a different medium. Like, did you have to like rewrite some things as you're realizing that, you know, I was writing this as if I'm writing a play versus completing a chapter in this book. Did that, did that come up? I'm, I'm just curious. I had a phenomenal editor named Chris Jackson, uh, who I saw uh, yes. because forever <laughs> in a day, um, my pop has been saying, when are you writing your book? When are you writing your uh, book? And I was like, I don't know, what book? What are you talking about? But he saw, he recognized something. So when I thought, oh, I think I know the answer to pop's question, and I think it's now, mm -hmm. um, I said, let me find an editor who can really guide me through this process. And the times that Chris pushed me hardest were on the details. So he'd be like, 
paint the scene. You know, you don't, you're not supposed to tell, you're supposed to show on stage, but here he's like, no, I want to know what it feels like when that, you know, um, yeah. truck goes by and you're, you're pulling the air horn. And so, so he um, coaxed more details out of me. And, you know, one, I'm married to someone who has a, a really like sports and facts based memory. He remembers who won the <laughs> Super Bowl when on, you know, at the, you know, a buzzer beater or whatever. I don't even remember like what school I went to in fourth grade. Like I think <laughs> entire chunk of information missing, but I do remember so much the texture of our times together. So actually what I found was I had so many more details in my heart, um, you know, that just, I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah if the Phillies won that year, but there was so much that I did, so many details I did hold. I mean, I, I have to say that I absolutely loved the way how the title was interwoven into every page and every word of the book and how you describe all the different types of languages that you lived and learned throughout your life growing up, growing up in West Philly. How did you arrive at this title? <laughs> I'm just curious, was it the title first no, and then the writing started no. in a more chronological order? 50th title, no, no, no. And that was the other thing Chris pushed me on is what is the organizing principle? So, yeah. And I, we realized, I realized late on, oh my gosh, it's language. Of course. At first, you know, here's a little um, like behind the scenes process. The, the original title of the book was Four Possessions. Because ah. the, in the plot of the book, I witnessed my mother's um, deepening pursuit of her spiritual gifts. She's a shaman. She's a natural healer. Um, she can speak to the spirits and then she becomes a priest and that that it's a path that takes a tremendous amount of rigor and study and practice. A priest in Lukumi. And I witnessed her, one of uh, my experiences with that is witnessing her in spirit possession. And it, it was a remarkable and moving experience for me as, as a young person and I didn't understand, but I was also in awe. Um, I was very curious. I was very upset because I remember watching it. I thought to myself, oh my gosh, this woman, this powerful woman, my mother, she is not mine. She does not mm. belong to me. She belongs to herself and she belongs to the spirits. You know, so that was a shocking thing to feel inside as, you know, in the middle school. Then what happens is I become a writer and something strange happens to me four times. And so the plot of the book was the four times that I, I'm taken over and I lose control of myself and a writing act or a storytelling act happens. And it's, is it a possession? It's different than what happened to mom, but there is a similarity. Mm -hmm. um, and then the book ends with the last time I had that experience in my life. So the book was originally called Four Possessions because that was huh. the plot. But that wasn't the connective tissue. And when I realized, I, I kept rereading it and looking for clues in the text. And there's a line that says that, you know, my mother was born in Puerto Rico. She was a native Spanish speaker. I was born in Philly. I'm a native English speaker. Um, and there were varying degrees of English and Spanish in our family. And so I said at Abuela's house, actually bodies were the mother tongue. Um, mm that's the one language we all had equally fluent in common and bodies never got lost in translation. You know, the second language was Spanish. The third language was English. The fourth was like Spanglish, which you could use and calibrate according to your needs. And that was the key. Then I started looking at all of the languages and I realized from my youngest time, I was absolutely in love with language and I felt absolutely trapped by language. Hmm. And, and kind of the push pull. And I have to say, like, that's actually what you sense in by reading the book, right? Like the kind of that feeling of liberation and trapped, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like you're trying to make sense of the language. And I love how you describe the joy and vividness you had growing up in this huge Puerto Rican immigrant uh, family in Philly. Um, I love this, this line, cousinhood in my big ass family was a swim with the sharks wonderland. Yeah. Um, <laughs> family is so, Family, I mean, you know, as I was reading it, I'm thinking about my Filipino cousins. I'm here in the Bay Area. There's like 34 of us just in the Bay Area. 
right? So family is so important in all immigrant families in this country. So what was it like recounting and remembering all the details that you wrote about, you know, like the happy and not so happy instances that you really, you know, shared with the readers? Um, to, to go back, you know, the whole book got triggered when I watched an old home video and it was a dance party at Awala's house. The, the music was Bachata Rosa by Juan Luis Guerra and <laughs> we were dancing our asses off. And it was amazing. It was gorgeous. And remember, I was the youngest cousin. So I had these yeah. cousins. Their bodies are gorgeous. They're so vital. Their senses of humor. They're all very different from each other. But to me, I say in the book, they're my, they're my pantheon. They're that of God within me. I was in awe of them. And so to see, it, that, oh, I wasn't just making it up in my memory to see them dancing on this home video. It just ignited my heart. I said, I want to go back to that time. I want to write about what it was like when my eyes went up to Mary Lou's belly. You know, remember it from that point of view. Um, so remembering, for instance, the first time I got my period um, and my cousins, I was with my cousins. I was far from my elders, so it was just my cousins and me at Six Flags. And I felt embarrassed and they took care of me. It was such a fun day, but it was also a humiliating day. And they really took care of me. I had never experienced that side of them. They were always wild, dancing, telling jokes, like stuff I didn't understand. And all of that went away when I got sick. And they, the tender, huh. you know, I had seen Abuela be that tender, yeah, but never, you know, my big cousins. It was wonderful to go back and remember those things. Um, and it was equally hard to go back and remember um, the challenges that we faced as a family. By the way, I have a few more questions to ask, but please remember you can actually ask questions yourselves. So there's, there's that button there at the right hand corner. So please make sure to ask your questions. So I, your mom, you know, your spiritual shaman mom is really a big character in this book. And, you know, as you describe your upbringing and being raised mainly by your mom after your parents split up, you write about how your mother's amazing story of, you know, being this feminist leader, social mm -hmm. justice warrior and overall badass immigrant woman. Can you describe a little bit more in depth how important she is in your life? I think overall badass spiritual woman. By the way, I love your shirt. And I now I have a oh. shirt that says overall badass spiritual woman. I think that that's <laughs> um, I might have the guts to wear it, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, one of the things I've been reflecting on, because I was writing about um, my mother worked for various service organizations in the community, especially in regards to what was then called Hispanic Women's Health. She also mm -hmm. founded her own organizations. Um, so, you know, I was a latchkey kid or because she was always out on the street getting health resources to people. Um, or I was like in the backseat of her car learning what, you know, learning about STD transmission when I was nine years old because that's what she was having meetings about in the front seat of her car, you know? So... Um, one of the things I've been reflecting on at that time, you know, Puerto Ricans were not new to Philly. Hmm. Not like we were the oldest community in Philly either. And really when my mom came in the mid, the mid to late sixties, she didn't just, it wasn't pu plug and play. It wasn't like a Mac computer where the accessories come, you plug them in and boom, you got it. Your system's all set up. They still had to build the community. They literally were building the community. A lot mm. of the services that have now become multi-million dollar organizations that reach far more than Puerto Ricans. Now it's not just the Puerto Rican community, it's an, a wider immigrant community, a wider Latino community, and other immigrant groups have moved in too. Um, you know, so we, things like Aspida, these, these huge service organizations, no, those things didn't exist. We take them for granted now, but those things were being built, like in living rooms, in church basements, mm -hmm. and it was people like my mom, and she was only one of many. Yes, she was a badass spiritual woman, but she was one of many, and they built a community that I had the, the benefit of being born into. 
they created those services so that myself and my cousins and our children could have a little bit more foothold financial stability, have more ac equal access to things like scholarships, healthcare, uh, maternal healthcare, birth control, these sorts of things. But yeah, they had to build it. You know, that's real. It's real to build a bricks and mortar community. Well, I, you know, one of the things, by the way, is I, I, my first internship for a re for a newspaper was at the Philadelphia Daily News uh -huh. in 2000 and I covered homicides mm. and you know I lived in I lived at uh at Penn at the campus of Penn at a frat house which was hilarious wow. but I remembered going to West I just remember being in Philly looking like this with a name like Jose Antonio Vargas wondering where all the Asian people were I wish I would have known <laughs> that there was this vibrant Puerto Rican community in West Philly <laughs> because I just you know I was literally like it was such a it was my first experience of the East Coast which is a very black and white yeah. black or white kind of environment and then reading your book re really reminded me of just like how pockets of puerto ricans filipinos like that untold i mean this is other thing too that i love when i was reading maria and Jose's book mm -hmm. is just the mexican community in new york which we never really talked about right so there were some interesting parallels there reading her book and reading your book now in in your book there's there's a line when you said i visited enough center city friends spent enough time with dad in the burbs to know that this shit storm this run-on tragedy was not everyone's america so here you reference noticing the disproportionate amount of death, drugs, and violence growing up in El Barrio compared to other demographic areas of the city, state, and the country. You know, noticing this in, at an early age and having your mom as a community organizer, did this fuel your activism and the work you've done in your career? I mean, we're in 2021 and these issues continue to affect our cities, you know, and how, how have things changed for the better? How have, they, this, how have they actually stayed the same, right? And where do you think we can go from here? you know this was this was really devastating for me and the book des describes my background so um yeah. i come from a brown puerto rican family and a white jewish family yep and, and the first the earliest years of my life those two families were combined because my parents were still together once they separated i still maintained closeness with both families but they moved to different areas um and they moved to different segregated areas so all of a sudden, my life that had been very cohesive up until I was about five years old, six years old, all of a sudden, no, there's lines drawn and taking the train, it, you know, it, it was the map of my youth, getting the subway to 30th Street Station in Philadelphia, taking the regional rail train from mom's house out to dad's house in the suburbs and seeing what happens as you leave the city and get into wealthier and wealthier suburbs. Yep. Um, and even not wealthier suburbs, but whiter suburbs. Um, that was devastating to me because all of a sudden I saw two sides of the coin and the coin was me and the coin was this nation. The coin was the city of Philadelphia I lived in. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, those two sides did not mess with each other. Yep. That was there. That was there. And no, there was no bridge. Like I was the bridge and I was not, children are not equipped to be a bridge. Okay. Um, so that, that was a huge part of my social awakening. And I think I, at some point I said, I have to do something about this. I have to bear witness. And also because of my, of my being white presenting, I was in a lot of white spaces where things would be said, you know, about those kind of people and those kind of communities that would not have been said had it been my mom or my sister or my cousin or my Thea in, in those rooms. You know, we were so maligned as a community at that time, at the hardest time to also have our spirits questioned. Um, there's a part in the book where I talk about the phrase welfare queen. Mm, yeah. Yep. It landed on me like, you know, a ton of bricks when I first heard it, because the implication is that a woman has a child to get a check. It's so cynical about a woman's capacity to want a family and to want love in hard circumstances. You know, so this was, I, I at a certain point, I just thought, you know, I want to bear witness. And at the same time, 
I'm sitting at Awala's house and I'm like, this is the best book I've never read. This, this shit's great. You know, I want to read about this. So I was like, let me, let me write about this. Well, it, it, what was interesting too is like seeing how in many ways you're right. Like kids are not meant to be bridges, but that's the role you played in a way, right? Like that was the role that in many ways it felt like not a burden, but it felt like it was something you had to kind of carry. And I'm curious how I was, I was talking in the beginning about this wonderful um, profile of you in the New Yorker by Daniel Pollock Pausner. And you, you said something here about, you know, some of your Puerto Rican relatives told you that immigration isn't really quote unquote your fight, but you didn't see it that way. This is the quote you gave. Choosing an immigration story is a direct response to being a part of, of a Latino community that by luck of the draw happens to get citizenship rights and wondering what to do with that privilege. Yes, yes. Is, yeah. is that part of being the bridge? Is that part of like, you know, your background, you, you, your mixed background and feeling like, wait, like I'm, I'm, I'm Latina. This is a part, this is a choice that I can make to be a part of. One of the values that I was raised with all the time in mom's car, in abuela's kitchen, was this notion of being servicial, being of service. Mm. And yeah. it was a very humble point of view on life. You know, on the island, I mentioned this in the book, on the island, there would always yeah. be an extra plate of food reserved just in case someone passes by. So you could <laughs> say, you know, please come and, and, and eat from our plates. Um, you know, and these were modest, these were modest families, you know, it's not like there was a ton of spare food, but they lived cooperatively and being servicial was important. Now, then the migration happens. They moved from the farm to Philadelphia. They moved to a certain neighborhood in Philadelphia that had a lot of green space because that was an early enclave. And this notion of being servicial, they bring with them. And when you're building, as I've said before, the, the services necessary in a community being servicial becomes about humble little acts of generosity and kindness to your neighbors, but it also becomes about um, advocacy on a more um, community wide level. So these are, I'm just seeing my elders model this. It wasn't just my mom, my aunts were very politically active. My Titi Juni, she, you know, was raised on a farm and she started finding these vacant lots in Philadelphia and creating local um, gardens, community gardens in them. And then they get pushed as, you know, I, I don't know, are Puerto Ricans immigrants? Are we migrants? Mm. And we get pushed farther and farther because of gentrification, farther and farther north into neighborhoods that have no green space. So we start out as earth people, you know, yep. this journey and we end as concrete people. Um, and again, that notion of servicial stays with us and is something that is, you know, it's my legacy to choose to embrace or not. But I think part of um, feeling that immigration more widely um, is a part of my responsibility to address. Yes, it comes from that. Uh, well, speaking of food, by the way, <laughs> um, Food is such a big component to our immigrant stories and experiences. And I really love the chapter where you go into beautiful detail on how to cook rice <laughs> with your grandmother and cousins. I'm just curious, are there any anecdotes that you'd like to share that you didn't share in the book while you and your family were, you know, cooking up the storm? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, always. I mean, that's, you know, we, my mom has a big living room. It's <laughs> remarkable how unused that living room is. It is just like, even if it's 10 of us, we will be in the kitchen. That's where we'll be hanging out the whole time. It's cooking, talking, sharing the history. Um, I, I eavesdropped a lot at Abuela's house. Like people would come eat. Um, there was a time, this didn't make it into the book. I didn't put this into the book because I was worried it seemed like stereotypical of a benevolent elder or something like that. I didn't want to be that corny, but it's a memory I have very deeply, which is Abuela was so servicial. Now, the point is you want to be humble and servicial, but not small. You still take up space, mm. You're still a full person. So don't mistake humility with um, self-deflation. But 
I went and really had a thing, you know, we got to talking me and the younger cousins one night, cause I was like the youngest cousin in my generation. So I was like the elder to the next generation. And, and they were all like, hey, has anyone ever seen I will really sit and eat a plate of rice and beans? And I'm like, <laughs> oh shit, we haven't. She just like be serving us and serving us. And you know, I was a big woman. So this wasn't like a body issues thing. She wasn't like eating. <laughs> We decided we were like, okay, we're gonna um, we're gonna sneak attack her. We're gonna find when she eats. So we were upstairs in the room that was air conditioned. We're watching Looney Tunes, and we hear the the pot that we cooked the rice in is a cadero, and it makes kind of ding. You can hear it when you lift the lid from the pot. It makes a very subtle dinging sound. And we heard it. We were like, y'all, y'all, let's go downstairs. So we sneak down the stairs. We're sneaking down the stairs, and we look over, and she's eating the remaining rice out of the pot standing over the stove. And we said, so, well, we got you, we got you, we saw you eating. And we humiliated her. We humiliated her. <laughs> she, she wept and she was angry and she said, don't sneak up on me like that. I was not eating. And she made us sit and she served us the rest of the food and made us eat it. Um, so I didn't put that in the book I, I don't know, what, you know, it didn't quite fit with the language theme, but yeah, there are so many uh -huh. stories and. <laughs> well, I, act, I I actually think part of promoting this book is just all the recipes. I'm just curious, like stuff that you might want to share. Well, okay, so I, I have a, a couple of more questions, but please, please, uh, we, we're getting a few more questions in our chat box there, so please add more. Um, I have to ask, so in the, in the book you said, every book, a horizon, a world I had no prior access to, an eye opening. You know, this is you sharing your love of books. And, you know, I feel the same way. <laughs> Would you be able to name, I'm just curious, like top five, let's say, most influential authors and or books and why? I'm looking at my bookshelf and <laughs> the first thing I see is a book a memoir by Piri Tomas, which is down these mean streets. Mm. That knocked my socks off and knocked me to the ground. And I read it as an adolescent and I reread it when I was writing this book. And I, I didn't understand it when I was a teenager in the same way. He is a black Puerto Rican. He is the darkest skin in his family. And he, as a child, doesn't understand what the reader understands to be colorism in his family. Um, it's the time, he's in the Bronx, it's the time, it's the historic time, it might be Harlem, I actually am not, I don't totally remember that. Um, and it's the historic time when crime is taking over and he gets sucked into that and then he gets locked up. And in lockup, he begins to read, he develops a love for literature and he says, Piri Tomas says, I began to dig what was inside me. Hmm. And to me, that's a formative sentence because I was writing about farmers. I was writing about my family farming. Yeah. I was writing about my mom making an herb garden with the hoe and breaking the earth. And he said, I began to dig, dig what was inside me. So that one, that book has been very special. Um, James Baldwin has been very special in general, but also in relation to this book, the first time I read Go Tell It on the Mountain, Mm, yeah, it was in my early twenties, and I had I'd had these possession writing experiences, but I didn't understand them at all. And then I read Go Tell It on the Mountain, and he has a a very wild and primal religious experience there. I read that book on an airplane. I wept, I ugly cried in the middle seat because I said that <laughs> happened to me. What happened to him happened to me, in a different way, in a different world, in a different life. And I I wanted to tell tell the woman's side of it. You know, yeah. a lot of the books that I love are by men. And I was like, I want to tell the woman's side of it, but not exclusively. I love Ntozaki Shange, her play for colored girls. Yep. Considered suicide when the rainbow's enough. That was formative for me because that is about women's space. That's about a laying on of hands. It's about healing the wounds. Um, Esmeralda Santiago, when I was Puerto Rican, uh -huh. foundational text, foundational text. And the last one I'll mention is um, Marta Moreno Vega, who is a, a phenomenal spiritual activist and art activist. Um, she was the original executive director of El Museo del Barrio in Harlem. Oh, yeah, in Harlem. Yep. And um, she write, has written books on the Lukumi path, 
which are very beautiful and respectful books. So I'm very grateful for the scholarship and, um, and storytelling she's put into the world. I have to say, especially since you mentioned Baldwin and he's right over there um, for me, he's right behind me. Um, you know, in some ways, I actually think your your career, the body of work that you build is kind of going down in that August Wilson, James Baldwin kind of canon. Like you've created like a canon of work um, at such a relatively young age. And I, I just have to say that, I mean, because it's true, you know. Um, and it, what's incredible too is the bearing witness is such a big part of it. So I just have to ask, I have a couple of more questions. So please add more questions in our, in our box here. Okay, two last questions I wanna ask. So given that I have seen an early, uh, I had an early screening of In the Heights, the movie, which you will love, and it will actually make for a really good companion for this book. So you have to get the book before you see the movie, which is coming out this summer. I'm just curious, what else is next? I, as I understand it, you were working on your book while working on the screenplay for In the Heights? Yes. Were you, were you doing them at the same time? I mean, not in the same day. I'm not like oh. writing <laughs> dialogue and then going and writing and finishing my chapter. You know, I, I block yeah. the time. So I would do like a month on the book, a month on the screenplay, that sort of thing. Um, but it's nice for me to get to go back and forth a little bit because then I find I don't get stuck so easily. It helps me come huh. to the writing with a fresh set of eyes. Um, it helps me get, get a little distance and then go back in again. Um, yeah, you know, it was, it was really cool writing something original, which is the memoir at the same time as I was adapting something. I had adapting, written. you had already written, right. but again, that, that's a whole, I, I could do a whole hour with you just trying to understand like you made really wonderful choices right yeah. how do you turn this because again i'm kind of a theater geek and so i've always been i've always wondered how you turn something you know even now i rewatch uh ma rainey's black bottom again a couple of nights ago because having seen the play being turned into a movie you you lose things you gain things yeah. and like so what else now are you working on? I, I, you know, so this book, this book tour is going to keep you busy for a while. But what else are you working on right now? What's next? I have a few other fun things in the works. So um, Lin Manuel and I wrote an animated uh, movie called Vivo uh, with one more collaborator who is Kirk D'Amico. He's the director and the co-writer with me. Um, and it's a, and here's what I love about it. I, I am a hopeless romantic okay i fell at 17 and i i've seriously been with him since like i i just love, the love story and they're not that common anymore so this is a love story and believe it or not it's for kids um so it was wonderful writing this animated movie i don't know when it's going to be released but it's it's complete now great um I'm doing lyrics for a stage adaptation of like water for chocolate with la santa <gasps> Uh, so that's oh my God! They're smoking, super sexy. You know, if if Vivo is very romantic, like Water for Chocolate is just hot. Okay, um, <laughs> and then I think I, I think a little downtime. I like taking time off. I took a year off a few years ago. That was really helpful to read. There's a prison writing project I do that helps uh, grab. Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I enjoy. So maybe maybe taking some time off before I, you know bite off more than I can chew on another big project. So here's my last question before I, 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 I get some of these questions here, which is, I feel that what your career has embodied is what it means to be a citizen artist, mm. right? That you are an artist, a writer, an artist, right? But you, but through your work, you, you, you show us what it means to be a citizen, meaning you are a part of a community that you're bearing witness to and that you're giving voice to and humanity to. Like, how, do you, I'm curious, first of all, if you agree with that. <laughs> Second of all, what do you think is the role of artists and writers at a time like this, which I am struggling to find a really a historical, like a historic parallel to? It's it's hard to figure out exactly where we are historically. It feels like it's a civil war and a reconstruction happening at once. 
That's what it feels like to me. So what is the role of an artist and a citizen artist during this time? You know, something comes to mind, Jose, this, there's a chapter I wrote on my mom's accent. Mm, yes. Because English was not her first language, English was her second language. Um, she speaks with an accent and um, it's about how I corrected her as a child. You know, and then I corrected her as a teenager when I honestly should have known better. Her English is beautiful, by the way. Okay, so I have no witness. I should know a damn lot more than me. And what I realized in writing that chapter, by the end of that chapter, I realized, you know, I never had to earn English. I was born into English. She actually had mm -hmm. to earn English. Therefore, it's her language, not mine. And I find that resonates quite alongside mm -hmm. the story of. I never had to earn my citizenship. It came for free. You know, this is where I was yeah. born. I was a citizen here. That's it. Whereas people who have had a long process, you know, the earning of one's citizenship, it takes a tremendous amount of commitment, love, struggle, uh, you know, unsureness, you know, so that anger, anger, <laughs> rage, humiliation. Okay. And yeah. so our, you know, our citizens and our community members who were not born here, they have earned their citizenship in a way I haven't. And so, mm. you know, and I'm the guest here and I better earn my place. Just like I'm the guest in the English language and I have to earn my mom's English. It's kind of a weird counterintuitive way to see it, but I have come to see that and I'm grateful I've come to that. And maybe that is part of the role of the artist, which is to say, we have to earn our humanity we have to shake up. We, we talk about the agony, James Baldwin says, we talk about the agony of experience. Um, and we have to earn our humanity by addressing that agony. Um, we have to stop living life as a habit and start living mm -hmm. life as a fully embodied, very complicated experience. Give life the respect it deserves by acknowledging its messy complication. And right now in a world of headlines that are very oversimplified and it's very stressful. Oversimplified, I mean, yeah. I confess, I, I, I could not turn on the news today. Yep, yep. I, I want to know what's happening in the George Floyd trial, but I was like, I can't look at it today. It's, it's too painful because it's oversimplified, you know, um, in addition to it being painful for other reasons. So yeah, so that, I think that's a part of the role of the an artist. Don't let us get in those bad habits. And actually I'm, I'm reminded now, I have, I have notes from reading the book and you know, the chapter you're, you're talking about is you, you're writing the book, mom, if you ever read this book and make it this far without disowning me, I ask you a favor, break this English language today and tomorrow and the day after and bestow it in your life with each breaking. Yes. I just thought that was so beautiful. So before I go to the questions, this is so I, I so I finished the book, right? So check out the book. I was reminded by Song of Solomon, which is Toni Morrison's third book, that the last line of this book is like legendary and is actually painted atop my little thingy here. But I thought I'm kind of a crazy Toni Morrison person. Chris Jackson knows this. Um, but there, I found this interview of her right after Song of Solomon came out. And this man was interviewing her and she was saying that, why is it that right now, this is 1997, why is it that right now everybody's talking about equal, just, equal justice under the law, better housing, better school? Why is it that you, Toni Morrison, have dared to, to say storytelling, myth, belief in magic? Why is that important? This was Morrison's answer. This, you can check this out on YouTube. The answer, she said, it's truth. It's not fact, but it is true. That's where truth lies in our myths, in our songs. That's where the seeds are. It's not possible to constantly hone on the crisis. You have to have the love. You have to have the magic. And then she says, and this made me think of you in your book, I regard my responsibility as a Black writer as someone who must bear witness, someone who must record the way it used to be, the way it ought to be, I leave to the sociologists, but I wanna make sure that a little piece of the world that I knew doesn't get forgotten. 
And then I read that, and then I remember that quote that Lynn Miranda gave the New Yorker writer when he said that you're in touch with spirits. That you have to remember that this is a woman you who went to playwright who went into playwriting because she says that her family stories, those in Puerto Rico, those in Philadelphia, would fade if she did not give them language. And you have done precisely that. <laughs> you have given, I think, beautiful language that captures the humanity of not only a community, but of a people. And as someone who's not Puerto Rican, <laughs> but as someone who um, is in many ways, you know, walking into the footsteps of what you've already walked into, I'm really, really grateful for that. So thank you for your work. I thank you. So, the gratitude is super mutual, man. I mean, <laughs> I'll never forget. Don't you, you have those visceral, I'll never forget reading Jane, you know, reading Go Tell It on the Mountain on that middle seat in an airplane. Yep. The, the, the smell of the airplane, I will never forget reading your New York Times magazine piece. Cool. In 2011, was it? Um, yeah, 10 years ago. That, Crazy. That literally, literally changed me. And I remember exactly where I was. I remember the trees that were right there that changed me. And so the, the gratitude uh, is, goes into oh. me. Thank you. Salamat, as we say in Tagalog. So I'm going to take some of these questions. We have quite a few here. So, okay, okay I'm just going to go right through them. I'm going to read through them. So this is a good question. How do you navigate both your American and Puerto Rican identity in a time where everything is so polarized, including identity? I have to really constantly remind myself um, that the notion that there is a singular authentic self or a singular authentic voice is like a weird external notion that is not correct. That in mm. fact, the times that I have felt most connected with identity are the times that I accept um, all of the contradictions inside me. It's probably just honest to who I am. As I, as I mentioned earlier, um, once my parents split, I actually felt that I, my life was in opposition to itself at times. That's a strange way to feel. And I could have chosen one side and just cut off the other. Uh, yeah. I didn't want to do that. I love my, both sides of my family. So instead I had to hold those internal wars actually as a part of myself. Um, so I don't, I, I don't choose. Um, I consider, I saw you put out a tweet today. I've been thinking about this of, you know, we're not half this, half that. Yeah, yeah. We're fully many things. And I think in addition to being fully many things, I do feel 100% Boricua. I do feel 100% white and I do feel 100% mixed. So that's 300% yeah. right there, let alone the other thing. And sometimes, honestly, I feel 5% Boricua. Sometimes I only feel 5% white, you know, these things oscillate. And so my, I, I, I just try to really pay attention to the details there. That, well, again, I tweeted that because I, you know, I, I have a lot of nieces and nephews and many of them are mixed race and how they've been handling a lot of the anti-Asian violence, mm -hmm. like owning their identity as Filipino or Filipino has been really interesting, like watching them do that. And then I'm thinking to myself, how do we give them agency? How do they define it for themselves, right? I love what you just said. Sometimes they just wake up and it's only 10% Filipino because they had adobo today or something. And that's okay, right? That's okay, right? Um, another, this is another good question. I love the chapter on how quintessential music was is to your story, especially having gone to Yale for your BA in music composition. Do you still play music? Would you still pursue a musical career? Um, the cool thing about it is, so yeah, we didn't touch on that, but just for other people who are here tonight, who might not have read the book yet, the, the whole first half of the book is my life studying music. I studied classical piano. I'm like a, a depressed kid and Chopin is like my God, it's <laughs> my therapy. Um, I study, um, Caribbean piano with I don't think his name is in the book, but with a master Cuban pianist named Elio Villafranca. Um, I go I go to CBGB in New York. Like there's a lot of music in my life <laughs> to go study music. And um, and then there's a moment when I decide to become a writer and it happens like that. It happens so quickly. And in my mind, in a matter of a breath, this whole ceremony happens where I say goodbye to all of the music that has made me who I am. 
and I didn't see it coming. I didn't see that goodbye coming. And then it's on me and then they're gone. I had to thank, Mm. I had to thank Schubert. I had to thank um, Bach. I had to thank um, John Coltrane. I had to thank them ceremonially in my spirit and then they're gone and I become a writer. And of course they're not. I just write it more. Everything I learned in music, it's all, it all fuels the structure. It, it helps me collaborate with amazing composers like Lin Manuel because yeah. I can kind of understand a little bit more um, the songwriting structure. So I, I do consider myself a professional musician. I just do it with words. <laughs> Last question that I have to ask because has, this hasn't come up yet. How does your Jewish background influence your writing? You know, I think that's still a little bit of uncharted territory for me. Um, Mm. I had to do a little digging. I called up my dad for this book and I said, um, you know, I remember watching Schindler's List, dad. And all of a sudden the the (laughs) the cities was up there. And that was kind of the first I'd heard of that. So what gives, what gives? And, you know, the book is dealing with the silences in the Perez family, but there's a lot of silence on the Hudes family too. And those silences come out of survival. They come out of tremendous pain. Um, And so, you know, the answer to that is I don't totally know. And that work may lie ahead for me. Yeah, well, and again, like how amazing is that to be able to combine all of that, Puerto Rican, Jewish, embracing all of it, right? To me, that's like, I feel like I'm just finally, I was in a meeting the other day and said, hey, how does it feel like to be our Hispanic member? Because everybody was Asian. And I'm like, I should just own the fact that I am like the Hispanic <laughs> Jose in a lot of these Asian environments. I well, mean, I, a little history, so. <laughs> a little, exactly, right? Um, well, I cannot wait to meet you in person and to get my book signed in person. And I'm just so grateful, again, for this book and for your work and for existing the way that you do. Thank you so much. And this was such a remarkable conversation. I want to thank you both for being part of Books and Books' virtual universe. I know it's not the same as in person, but what a marvelous and insightful conversation. So that's the silver lining, I think, of these times, the intimacy, right? So, you know, something that came to my mind is just how interesting that, that you don't define like one particular a person, but many voices. And it just made me think how lucky you are that you grew up in such a household and that you had spirits around you and talking to you and you were able to channel, you know, maybe that is part of the fluidity and the creativity Mm. of the work is fed by all of that. So thank you so much for sharing yourself with us so beautifully tonight. I'll remind everyone, yes, perfect. Everyone that's watching, uh, if you haven't picked up a copy, you can just click on the green button. We'll ship it right out to you. If you're in Miami, you want to come by one of our stores. This is a book that we love. You're going to find it in all of our stores at Books and Books. And just thank you so much for joining us this evening Um, and to everyone who's watching as well. And stay safe. Keep doing what you do so brilliantly, and we'll be watching and reading. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.